All right, everyone. Hello. How are we doing? And welcome to this best of five series between the Blue Zerg player in the top left-hand side, Dark from Dragon Phoenix Gaming, taking on the Red Terror in bottom right from the Shopify Rebellion Beyond. This is a series from the Alima League April Monthly Finals, which means it was played during May, I believe the 4th of May to be exact. So this is, like I say, I was saying this a little bit beforehand, but um, just in case you just watched the YouTube video or so, this is about a month old. Um, I don't usually like to cast stuff that's this old. I'm just in a bit of a state where I don't have many replays going spare and stuff like that because I've been moving house. I've just not been as organized as lately. And so I just need to make some content so I don't really have much of a choice. So I'm just going to cast what I've got, which is this series, which honestly, I mean, it's still the same map pool. It's still the same patch. It's not like anything too crazy has changed. Maybe a bit of meta things, but hey, I mean, you know, Beyond's going to play 2 one ones anyway, and Dark's going to play Roaches and Talurkas and... You know, nothing's changed there in recent times, so... <laughs> yeah, not not sure how worried we should really be, is what I'm saying. Alright, so uh, game one of this best of five. If you are watching on the YouTube and you do end up liking the commentary in the video, please do consider leaving a like on the video, and please do consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, we're in a little bit of a dip once again on the YouTube after we've had a big uh, positive as of late. Uh, so yeah, uh, those likes actually go a long way, they help us out a whole bunch. I'll try and get the YouTube back on track, especially because DreamHack, when it, when this goes up, it's the first day of no DreamHack in quite some time. So it's it's time it's kind of our time to actually uh, get some you know good uploads going again. And boy, do we have some content coming up as well, as we do have stuff like I mean, even this week, guaranteed Maru versus Serral going to be happening on a, on Wednesday, I believe. So yeah, there's going to be some great uploads coming up. So like, subscribe to see more, help us out. All that good stuff. Now, this is aggressive from Dark. The pull first into Lings to push back this initial SCV, and then the Roach Roran coming down already. Which is going to be very exciting. Uh, so he's just going to get aggressive right off the start now. We know Dark likes his Roach Openers, but again, usually he likes his Roach Openers, which lead into Macro. This is a Roach Opener into a straight-up all-in, right? So, yeah, we'll see how much he does, see how much he commits to it. A lot of the time, you can use this as a pressure play. You come in with the roaches, you get a bit aggressive, and then you just kind of fall back and, you know, you drone behind it. But there's absolutely a phase of this game that's going to be revolving around roach production, and it's right now. Is it just going to be three roaches into Ravages? Nope, there's a fourth roach at least. As we get this up and running. These things come in, and they are going to grab this SCV, so they're going to be able to take that down. On SCV at least, but look at Beyond's Bunker. It's actually in a bit of a safe place. It's funny because it won't really protect the front, but it is probably more protected here against the Roach attack, and it's not like you mind in your super early Roach attack coming into the natural. Because these SCVs are going to be pulled to a bunker anyway, so I actually don't really hate it, and Beyond is doing the exact correct thing against this. Marine production, no Hellions. Hellions are completely useless against those Roaches. And then you've got the Cyclone against the Roaches too. The one weakest thing here is probably just going to be against the lings, but these are slow lings, no speed. So even then, I'm not even sure you're really in desperate need of Hellions to be able to clean these up. I much prefer having the Cyclone and Marine production on the way, and a couple of Hellions and, well, a single Marine or a Tech Lab building on this barracks or anything. Absolutely. Now, the Cyclone, we'll see what's up. Unfortunately, used its lock-on on a Zergling, which is less than ideal. There's those SCVs pulling into the repair position. Couple of cross of bars. SCVs will dodge. One goes down, actually. This bunker might fall. Marines have plenty of time to put out damage, though. As you can see the Cyclone getting a lock onto a pretty fresh HP Roach, but then it doesn't move back, so the Cyclone gets picked off. That's uh, that's pretty crazy. It's just going to be seeing these few Marines continuing through, and a couple of Lings taking some additional damage. That Ravager actually going down as well, so these few Marines in the high ground still doing okay. Five SCVs killed so far. Doc is now droning behind this. But only after you made 14 more Zerglings, still with no Ling speed, remember. So it'll be difficult to imagine those Lings get too much more done here. Orbital Command has to lift up. And I feel like there's just enough Marines to really sustain against slow Lings right now. So Dog's just going to full on drone. But imagine all of these Lings, all 14 of them, were just drones. Because they're not going to do anything aggressive, right? Imagine that. Then you're on 30 workers against 25. Then you're actually in an okay spot. Instead, right now, you're still behind on SC, uh, on the drone count or the economy. Work account, I should say. I'm looking for the general term. Yeah, if you're behind on the work account coming out of this, it ain't exactly pretty. Because now you lose an Overlord too, and that's a pretty definite supply block, right? That's going to be you stuck there for a good 15 seconds or so. So a bit of a tough time here for Dark. And this attack 
You know, it actually, honestly, it did better than expected. I feel like the Cyclone could have been micro better. But, um, yeah, it, it, honestly, for what Bjorn set up into, it did really well. Because Bjorn was really hard countering it. So it actually did really well considering that. And he just could have been coming out of this actually on a lead. And instead, it just kind of feels, at best for Dark, probably even. But I actually think I prefer it for Bjorn. Still up on workers, if only by one. You've got to remember, he's got mules in play. He is now going to start a third CC. And he's got map control in the form of Cyclones. And they're actually going to start clearing out this creep spread because you don't have link speed. You can't really do much about it. So one of the things where you skip Hellions is usually you don't get to deny creep and you don't get as much map control as usual. But without link speed, none of that map control is here for the Zerg. So he's really lacking as well as, oh, this is really bad. One queen already died. Now these other queens are in some trouble. There is zero reason for these Cyclones to not commit to getting those kills. And that's three dead queens in the front. The Cyclones are slaying the queens. And the Medivac can now just lift up and evacuate them. Finally, link speed on the map. So you can see Dark take a bit more kind of, you know, actual real map control. But no third hatchery. Queens are dead, so he can't replace the creep at the front. So he's going to be very limited with creep spread. I mean, this is really looking uh, pretty fantastic here. As Marines and Cyclones just going to come through and pushing a few of those links back. I'm just going to be seeing the Evo Chambers on the way up from Dark as we get that rolling. So... A couple of Evo Chambers coming through. The Lings are coming out in production. Still, don't tell me we're going to lose another Queen. No way. Another Queen going down. I mean, this is becoming absolutely abysmal right here as the Marines and Cyclones pick off a hatchery. I'm just going to be seeing plus one attack coming in on the engineering base. Stimpak coming up. And plenty of Lings from Dark heading down to this bottom right-hand side as well. So in they go just to try and do something. But tank coverage says, nuh -uh. I mean, where do you go from here? Dog's making a few roaches because, well, you need some units. But the third hatch is still down. You don't have a lair. I mean, this is absolutely just a game which continues to just, you know, devolve further and further into Bjorn's advantage. It just really, there's just, well, I, I'm trying to, I'm stuttering and stumbling because I'm like, I don't even know what to say. Like, to describe Dog's position in this game is almost, you know, words that we don't have in the, in the English language because he is just so, so dead. Uh, he's just in a really rough position, and I feel like the numbers don't even justify how bad of a place he's in right now. You know, yeah, eight workers behind seems bad, but I actually think it's so much worse than that. Because everything Bjorn has is just going to be such a hard counter tank, so Roach Ling attacks are going to be bad. There's no less, so there's no Roach speed. I mean, Dog Star melee upgrades, but he doesn't have a Bane Nest. He doesn't have, well, still a lair, like I was saying. <laughs> yeah, I... He still doesn't have a third hatchery, so, I mean, lings are just difficult to make because you just straight up don't have the production you need to actually make lings in good numbers. See, so yeah, across the board, this should just be a one game for Bjorn, uh, and very much so just came kind of from the openings a lot of the time. As we do just have our... I, I feel like we're going to have one attack here, right? We're making lings. It feels like Doc's maybe just going to go with, like, melee upgrades. He starts a fourth hatchery, but Doc, please explain to me what we're going to do without a lair in this game. I mean, there's one thing missing out on, like, roach speed, but then you're also not going to have access to 2-2. I guess this hatch is just for lava, and you're just going to swarm units and try and overwhelm an army, and then win on the counterattack. That is my only possible prediction of what the heck is going to actually happen here. Because of Bows going down and taking down the siege tank to begin with. It's a very, very good start as nine marines in production. Combat shield on the way as well. Here come these lings and ravages gonna start swarming through. Marines gonna activate their stims. A lot of these lings continue to go down. The raven overhead. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, not a bad attempt from Dog. You can see where the idea is at, right? Like I say, you clean up this army and maybe you get enough momentum to counterattack off the back of it. That could be really cool. But I think that was really his only option, and he just didn't do enough because these Marines are still standing at the end of the day. Uh, and a big problem with this is just the fact that you don't have the Banelings or the Splash Damage at all, really. And you don't really have the swarminess of Roach Ravage to make up for lack of Splash Damage, so... You know, it's just not good all around. Auto Turret's going to buy a little bit of time. Uh, and otherwise, this is very much so just an A-click step forward from Björn. Not much else is really needed here. For Bjorn to end up 1-0 to zero in the lead in this best of five. GG's.
All right, let's dive on into a game number two. As Bion goes up the one zero lead. In the top right hand side, our blue Zerg player down one map is going to be from Dragon Phoenix Gaming, Dark. And in the bottom left hand side, our red Terran player sending an SCV out. Bion from the Shopify Rebellion. Again, this uh, this set of games comes from the Elimu League Monthly Finals, and I just want to say a shout out to Elimu League. They've had issues with scheduling lately and uh, stuff like that, just because there's so many events on. So they're currently on a break uh, as of the time of speaking for the upcoming month, and uh, they might not even return. Uh, is what they said. They said that you know there's so much content out there nowadays with the Korean scene that it's not necessarily. It's not necessarily needed that the, you know, the Alimu League just isn't necessarily needed anymore, right? It, it, there's no gap to fill in the Korean content scene almost sort of thing, right? So it's that's kind of crazy to me. That's, uh, that's really, really wild. But uh, it is also kind of true. I know I've been guilty a little bit of running over Alimu League with my events here and there when I've been pushed to kind of have things happen a bit more often, but mostly just because of also everything else that's going on. You know, there was a whole bunch of qualifiers that showed up. It forced my event to have to squish over to other days. And at the end of the day, there's just a point where there's only so much time in a week, right? And everyone has to kind of run their events. So yeah, we did our best to try and avoid. But yeah, it's kind of an, it's kind of the problem with running like a weekly event, right? You have very limited maneuverability. You know, if, if something overlaps you, then it's very difficult to move because you rely on being like an, a weekly open sign up cup. They did mention they might come back in a different form, different format. So I actually think that would be really cool for Lima League. So I'm kind of hoping that something like that happens. Because uh, I think it would be very sad for Lima League to just be kind of, you know, done and dusted and not coming back altogether. I think that would be really sad. So kind of hoping. Anyways, um, shout out to Lima League. And uh, hopefully just come, uh, just find a way to, to come back in some kind of awesome manner. Lots of drones pulled here as this two racks gets set up. And uh, obviously just really wants to make sure these links get out to deny that bunker coming through. Spine building as well. Kill pulling all the way back into what is now four marines here. One of these marines gets caught, surrounded in full. These marines are actually running out of places to run to. But four of them up against the wall against these drones. They will not mind this fight. I have no idea why Doc is so desperate. Uh, I mean, seriously, that's like ten workers killed. Okay, you hard shut down the two racks, but at a cost which is, well... I'm going to put you in a horrible position in this game. Some might say his position is untenable. Because you're down 10 workers. I, I mean, I genuinely, what, what do you do from here? You're down 10 workers. You've lost a ton of mining time at the start. I mean, is there good news? You've got a spine crawler, so you can pretty much just drone from here on out. I suppose. Like, if that's, if that's your positive advantage that I'm speaking of right now... You're in some trouble, pretty much. It's, it's as simple as that. A couple links across the map won't do much. Even intercepted by Marines coming back home as well. I'm just going to be seeing a couple of drones continue to produce a refinery. Second gas coming in. And Bion just starts to expand. I mean, Doc will play catch up on drones? I mean, that is one nice thing here. You generally did remove the Marine threat from the map, so... That's uh, a pretty big positive, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, these are just sort of positions you don't really recover from very easily as a Zerg. And okay, the Terran might not kill you now, but give it two or three minutes, the Terran builds off of this advantage and starts attacking you. And you're going to have to come up with some absolute magic to make this work out at the end of the day. That is for sure. The tech lab on the barracks, Hellion production coming through, and we do have a starport about to be done as well, so we can even get a medevac up and probably a little bit of a Hellion drop to keep up the pressure. It's a very popular way of following up a two racks opening. We've seen it time and time again as of late, actually. The, uh, the double Hellion, or the quad Hellion, one medevac drop post two racks. I just remember it was a few months ago, Innovation started doing it all the time. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Turns out that has just become the go to follow up nowadays in this uh, proxy 2 racks gameplay as two more hellions will pop out here in just a moment and all four of them start to go across so dark needs a really good defense on this i mean look at the disadvantages 
445 in the game, about to be 5 minutes. Link speed just started. No third hatchery, that just now started as I was speaking. And he's going to have to be the defender again, so you really just can't afford to take any damage at all. The only good part of this for Dog is he recovers the work account to be at 36 against 29, so his work account is, is back up kind of in the right direction. So that's uh, that's definitely a, a big positive there, but that really is about it. Is just going to be seeing a few of these Hellions dropping off. He's going to fake the drop into the main and try and send the Hellions elsewhere. Run around toward the natural. Problem is there's a spine on the way in. Uh, Doc really fell for this big time. He pulled the drones, he sent the links to the main, and the Hellions get into the natural as well. Did we just talk about Doc having to work a lead? Well, that's just gone again, so down nine workers, exactly the number which he's just uh, lost here, so Hellions having a great time. What a play from Björn. Honestly, I think that's more more kind of fault to Doc though. Cool idea from Björn, but with this much creep spread, there should have been no way that Doc was as unprepared as he was for these Hellions to get in. The Hellions were like here on the creep, and the Lings here were still moving toward the main. He should be able to spot that sooner. I guess that's the power of forcing your know, drones to pull and Doc to pay attention there. The Hellions do get the jump on the natural, and it works wonderfully. And Bjorn, well, just guaranteeing that one of the things that Doc was starting to take advantage of that work account, just guaranteeing that that will not actually come into play here at all. And Bjorn just going to maintain his advantage here in this game number two. Looking like a pretty good scenery so far from Bjorn. Defends aggression game one. Has successful aggression game two. Doesn't really get too much better than that a lot of the time as the Marines are going to chase down this Overlord. Dark will find himself supply blocked. And this army of Bjorn going to make its way up to the top side. Some Marines, a couple tanks all setting up. There's a couple of these already going to get siege here and just going to be seeing our spine. Going to pull back a little bit. These tanks are all going to move over and again just trying to sell down in position. I like what they're doing. I think they're doing a, a decent job of this. There's a few Marines going to stim ahead. Dark has Lings on the other side of the map looking for a counterattack. And it's just going to be difficult no matter what you do. I mean, if you can survive to plus one carapace, that might help. There's no, you know, melee or marine upgrades in general coming through here from Bjorn. So, I mean, that will be an advantage Dark has for a while. I mean, this position is just tough to break no matter what. But plenty of queens. I guess the spine can move around a little bit too. And of course, right now, it's not like Bjorn is reinforcing this position. So, these links will stop reinforcements as well. And as long as that's the case... Yeah, as long as that's the case, I guess this really is not, you know, really ain't so bad, huh? I guess Doc won't die at least, right? It's obviously not great for him. He's supply blocked as well, waiting for Overlords to finish, but I think, you know, it, it sounds dumb, but, you know, as long as you're kind of not dying, it's probably the best you could hope for is Doc, so... Looks like he's going to jump on this now because he knows these reinforcements are going to get here from the medevac, so... Trying to make the most of it, jumping before it becomes too much of an issue, and he does get a decent surround on these Marines as well. It's just, how much does it actually matter? These Marines are shredding, clumped up against these Lings. Okay, the Carapace upgrade helps, but, I mean, a few Marines left at the end of it, and you can just see the resources lost. 3.2 get to 2.6k, so it's an efficient trade out of Bjorn. And, yeah, probably the best possible time for Dog to jump there, but... Best possible time doesn't always mean it's going to work for you, right? Again, you're just so far behind to begin with. Really tough to come uh, back into it then. I don't know if Ling's going to make their way around the bottom. As Marines go pushing on through, I'm just going to be seeing our tanks begin to siege up on the edges. A couple more Ling's being shot at, and... Well, I remember Ling trying to run up that ramp. It's going to get shot down as well, so that will also fall. I mean, Bjorn's just reinforced the exact same position. Now he's about to have 1-1 one, one upgrades. So there's not going to be a carapace advantage for Dark any longer. So one of the things that helped him out in the previous games is now just going to be disappearing. And as that siege tank gets taken down as well, the few Marines do what they can to push it away. Armory is about to finish up out of Bjorn, so he's going to go straight to 2-2. As Dark gets Banelings onto the map, but well, with also what feels like an eternity away from Banelings' speed, 
going to make it difficult to engage still as Marines actually going to catch these Zerglings. They have to split away in different directions to minimize their losses. And now this just means you kind of have split pushes going on as Bjorn is oh, just going to do very well initially against those few Zerglings coming through to get rid of some of these creep tumors as well. While all these people continue to go down for now, he target fires three of the five Valens that were running towards him. Now lifts up, goes to the main, and he's also going to push the left hand side. And this is the point at which he actually doesn't even go to the main, just drops on the third again. Because uh, the push on the left side is going to take Dark's attention. So that's just going to be GG. Bjorn too far ahead from the opening. And uh, Dark kind of made the right moves from being very far behind just. Sometimes, guys, you're too far behind to get back into the game. Sometimes it's just ain't possible. And that was the uh, situation right there. GG is Bjorn 2, Dark 0. And Bjorn off to a pretty fantastic start here in this series. Hoping that we get a little bit of a bounce back. And uh, this does not turn out to be a 3-0. As uh, really just hoping the early game goes nicely. I mean, even if we just get a decent game out of this, I feel like everyone's just dying. Well, Dark is just dying early time and time again. As the bottom left, we do have the blue Saren player. It is Bjorn. Up against Dark in the upper right-hand side as we get this up and ready to begin. Let's see if Dark can, like I say, survive the first four to five minutes without just being dead in the game. Would be would be kind of nice. Me and Roddy are like the new bitter dam. Nah, I wouldn't go that far. I think me and Roddy have some good fun together, though. The thing is with me and Roddy is that we really are just good friends, you know? So I think that comes through a lot in the casting. We have a good time. I think we see the game very similarly as well, which can be a good and a bad thing, because a lot of the time, what I say is kind of what Rod Roddy would say. But, uh, so that works well in terms of, you know, in terms of chemistry, but, you know, sometimes it's cool to have someone who sees the game in a different way, because they can create that kind of, like, conflict of casting. It's like, well, I think this. It's like, well, you think that, but I think this. And it's like, whoa, drama. <laughs> Not really drama, right? But you know what I mean, like, they can create a back and forth and create more of a discussion. Whereas with Roddy, I'm just like, damn, he just said everything I was going to say. I guess I revert back to my, you know, tried and tested classic of saying exactly what's on the screen. <laughs> Thank you for casting. No worries. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Again, just a bonus series at the end of the day after the Team League. I needed some content for my uh, YouTube tomorrow, so why not do an extra series here on Twitch? Hello, my name is Jones. Thank you so much. Converting from a Prime Gaming sub to a Tier 1 sub. Hell yeah. Thank you so much. Did you guys hear the Hero Marine roast of casters? I actually listened to this. He he didn't really roast casters. What he said was that the Dreamhack events always seem the same. And that it feels as though like the casters don't do a good job of like being exciting or hype. And it feels like every day is the same sort of thing. And like that is a roast of the casters. But I actually think so from my point of view... I don't see that as a roast of the casters as much as it's actually just a roast of DreamHack because as casters, we actually have this same thing, right? Which is none of us really like having to cast DreamHack online and none of us, I, I say none of us, I will speak from my own perspective then. I don't like the way that DreamHack works for our way of working because say, for example, I do like, you know, this week, for example, I did one week of DreamHack or I did one day of DreamHack this week. But there's so many more days of DreamHack I didn't do. So to be able to be fully on top and fully prepared for DreamHack on my day, I have to watch every other single day of DreamHack that I'm not getting paid for, right? So it's really difficult to be on top of everything and to, like, compare and talk about, like, continuations of stars and stuff. I can't necessarily justify watching everything from DreamHack if I'm only going to cast one day of it, you know? So, um... Yeah, no, I think, um, I, I think really, like, it's more of a fault of DreamHack, and, like, not really the fault of DreamHack, but just online casting in general is difficult. We don't have time to prep for who we're going to cast, because we don't know who we're going to cast until the day begins, and all that kind of stuff. That basically means that, and because it's so spread out as well, it's very hard to just get your cast in, like, tip-top shape for, like, one weekend, like you usually would. Instead, now you've got to have your cast in the best shape it can be over three weeks. It's just difficult, you know? Mediocre casting, expect for the four he put on top, with no one having adequate knowledge to make the game really shine through the lesser informed and insightful audience. I mean, if you if you listen to the same discussion I listened to, then that's not what I heard him say at all. 
Like, in, in the slightest, honestly. So, I mean, maybe we'd listen to different discussions, because I didn't even hear him name four casters on top. I heard him put Roddy and Maynard on S tier, and he didn't raid anybody else, so. Casters wanting to seem knowledgeable when they're really not. I mean, I, I didn't hear him say that either, so, to be honest, like, uh, maybe I'm talking about a different discussion that he had. Banshee and Cloak on the way up. I didn't talk much about this game just yet as Armory is coming through. That's going to be seeing a few Marines coming up and a Creep Gemma taking a little bit of damage. The Queen's coming through, the Medivac getting pushed away, and a couple of Creep Spreads coming back out down the bottom side as well. There's a few Spores on the way in, the Evolution Chamber's building up, and our Overlords all coming through too. I think at the end of the day as well though, is that... You know, at the end of the day, too, everyone wants different things in casters. And for, like, 95% of the audience, maybe not 95%, but for a good majority of the audience, you don't need custom slash Lambo level of casting knowledge to be informative and to be, you know, to be teaching people, you know? Yes, what Lambo and Harston provide is amazing, but that's not necessary as a caster to provide an entertaining and informative cast, you know? How about joining up here as this attack does get going? Obviously, you mentioned the armory. And a few queens continuing through, and just gonna push those halbats away. A couple creep teams are gonna start going down as. Just gonna see our uh, stim pack coming in back on the other side. A couple of additional racks coming through, and our stop. We're gonna jump off over to the left and get ready to go into a reactor. So, yeah, kind of a pretty passive push from, you know, Bjorn here. Third CC was building, and. He doesn't really commit through to get too much done. Yeah, I mean, Doc was pretty well prepared as well. Queens were in a good place. He was just ready to fight, basically, as he has melee upgrades coming through. Especially when you got melee upgrades coming through. I think it's actually really nice to be able to hold against this, because this is not a faster lair. And now you're going to get into fast upgrades much faster than what the Terran will have. So for once, you're going to have an upgrade lead here as the Zerg. Which is definitely going to be pretty awesome as our Lings come running in. And Marine's going to get surrounded from the other side. The Hellbat's putting good work against the Lings, though. I don't know if Dark really needed to fight that. Especially the way it ended up going. Just the fight didn't really work out very well at all. He lost a lot of Lings for very little gain. And the Medivac just kept on healing pretty much throughout. Our additional racks continue to build here. Now Orbital Command from Bjorn is going to lift off. Head on down to the low ground as well. It's going to be seen uh, upgrades all continuing through engineering bay as the armory. All of this continuing. A whole bunch of additional lings coming up right now as well. Extra overlords continuing on in. And our fourth hatchery setting up. Now we're down on the low ground. A couple of banshees coming through as well. So just kind of keeping these banshees alive. One of the great things that Bjorn has really done in this game so far is he's really just kept this kind of, you know, banshee control around the map. Been picking off some creep teamers. Being poking in for some drones here and there. And yeah, he's taking damage on them. Yeah, they haven't really done a lot. But the fact they're still alive means they still have that potential at some point further down the line. That's right now, Dark has a heck of a lot of Lane Bane. And one more upgrades in his favor. He's going to start a counterattack. But Bjorn sees it with the Banshees. And because the Banshees are alive, he starts to pull his units back to make sure that this is not going to be an overly kind of devastating run by. Of course, it pulls Bjorn back on, you know, back from the map. It pulls him back home. But, uh, but, but better to pull back home and not take damage than it is to be like, oh, huh, I'm going to kill off some creep tumors and oh no, 20 SEVs are dead, right? I'm going to go in again, but this time reinforcement should be enough to deal with this. So Bjorn can continue on to the map a little bit further. It's going to go through. Our spore crawler gets picked up. I'm just going to see Arling Bane going to waddle forward. No Bane speed yet. Obviously, the later layer, that is one of the downsides of it here, but you have the upgrade advantage initially to help out with it instead. Yes, yes, if he's going down. So this actually did okay on the counterattack, and honestly, the defense from Dog was pretty darn good as well as a Widow Mine gets through, and lots of lost mine time, if nothing else, over here. That'd be pretty crazy, actually. I mean, that's a lot of drones not mining on the main and natural, so Bion is getting economic damage done, even if it's not coming in the form of drone kills. These Banshees are here as well, so this base also wasn't mine. Jeez, that income advantage. <laughs> Look at the income differences. Bjorn basically just stops Dark Mining across all bases at once for a few moments. That's crazy. I 
Think of my Marines and a couple of Marauders pushing through. Those Widow Mines are going to burrow up and actually going to provide pretty decent coverage. We'll come to the top side in for this top hatches. Marines are going to uh, run in and these Lings are going to go for this. SCV's pulling in two, six, seven. Wurg is already down. These run buys are working out for Doc. It's kind of weird because I don't see Doc play this kind of style very often, but boy, it's pretty good at it. These run buys have been great, relentless, and that's what you got to be. I think one of the greatest things about Reynolds' DVT when he's on top is that his run buys are just never ending, right? And he's just always got something ready to poke the Terran's attention away and just try and make it work. And yeah, it's kind of cool to see Doc playing this because, like I said, this isn't really how Doc usually plays. We talk about Doc as those roach openings a lot of the time and stuff. So this is something very different from what I would have ever initially expected this to be. It's a nice cancel on the infestation pit, kills a drone. Again, just these couple of banshees. Overall in the game now, we're talking about 15 kills on them. Just slowly racking up the damage throughout the course of this and just keeping themselves going as best as possible. As we're going to be seeing this bioforce of Yun pushing forward here. A couple of lings already going down. The Bane's taking some damage. Widow Mine's going to fire. Huge Widow Mine shots actually hitting a good clump of the initial Zerglings there. The Widow Mine's targeting well this time around for Björn. He falls back to make sure that obviously the Widow Mines just don't hit him as only it's all the target fire on those Banelings. That was slick and amongst all of those Lings running through, he target fires down the couple Banes. It just means he has no threat, no reason to split away, lose damage time at all. He just stands there and fights. Beautifully done from Björn. And as we do, just pull back over the left side once again. Queens is going to come on forward. Widow Mines are going to be burrowing up. Zergling's going to keep on coming through this and Widow Mines going off all over the place. Things continue to go down as the rest of our Queens and Hydras continue to come on through, and they're just going to continue to take a whole bunch of damage. A couple more Banelings going down as well, just going to be seen as Zergling getting picked up. And these other couple of Banes also continuing to make their way towards this bio army. Oh, big connection there. One Baneling helping to push this back and keeping Dog alive as Hydras have to put in a lot of the work. The Banest is almost back online after it got denied earlier. Now, these additional Hydras finishing up, maybe Dark can help to push this back. I mean, it's tough without the Banelings. One thing for Björn is obviously the Widow Mines keep on coming through here as well, so he's got plenty of those to work with. As Five Racks push keeps on going, a fourth CC setting up behind it all as well. Widow Mines still burrowing up. Those Mines now are going to start going off into the center. He has still no Banelings, man. The kill on the Baneling Nest was massive. Uh, just being able to get far enough forwards that you can kill that. No, that's all because he had a couple of Baneling snipes during the fight, right? Gets far enough forward from there, is able to kill a Bane Nest, and the continued chaos that ensues from that is just magnificent for Björn, who, I mean, one Baneling rolls into a Marauder. Widow Mines are just hitting Hydralists, and there's not even Overseers here to really help out with this properly, right? I mean, these Widow Mines, kind of at this rate, feel as though they're going to get up to go off multiple times, which is always disastrous for a Zerg, a Widow Mine, for anybody, really. Widow Mines firing more than once in their lifetime. is generally very, very bad. An Overseer on the way up again now, but these Widow Mines are off cooldown. And then we go. Widow Mine's going to get a first few set of links quite easily. This one actually goes off towards the Marines, and a lot of Marines, I think, blew up to that Widow Mine. The Widow Mine field is left behind. Björn will try and reinforce it right now. But the Overseer here seems like this might be the end of what has been a terrorizing kind of uh, run of Widow Mines. Has allowed Björn to really keep this position and do a lot with it. Resource lost about a 4,000 difference. Not a bad place to be. I see Björn's army supplies being brought down a little bit in the economy. It's just about soon in Doc's favor. He can afford to be a little bit behind on resources lost. The only problem is, I'd say, Doc wants to be on 80 plus drones, not 72. And he gets the chance now to make those drones. But not having been on that 80 drone count all the way throughout this does just weaken that eco a little bit. And maybe means that he's just going to struggle that little bit more than he should going on from here. The bio joins up in the bottom right. As we do see that plus one missile attack upgrade coming on the Evo Chamber. A couple of these creep chambers are already going down as well. Drones dying off to a widow mine drop top side. Done just changing the pace a little bit. Gonna hit this right side instead of the top side. I don't mind it because he just took this fourth, so he can kind of rally through from his fourth base in a way. So yeah, I don't mind that at all. It's dark. Still in this Ling Bane Hydra setup. What he hasn't been able to do is transition through to the Lurker Den, right? And that's what you want to do a lot of the time. You guys remember when we saw that infestation bit build, cancel, rebuild? Still hasn't been used since then. And you would expect, you know, as an infestation bit finishes, Hive to start and in sync with it, a Lurker Den to build. But this has been a couple of minutes where there's just not been that progress, so it's going to be a huge delay on effective Lurkers. 
And that's going to be problematic, I'd imagine, as a few group tumors taking some hits. Starting to go down. Ben has the 3-3 three, three upgrades, at least plus 3 attack, his plus 3 armor's on the way. Again, with Hive, obviously, you just stuck on 2-2. Two, two. He will at least get the missile upgrade, because he is obviously using Lurkers slash Hydras. I say Lurkers, I'm assuming he's eventually going to get Lurkers. At the moment, it feels like he's just going to keep going with Hydras. I'd love to see the, uh... I would love to see Lurkers. Like, I mean, I just don't see what Doc's plan is if he wants to sell on Link Bait and Hydra all game. I just don't see how well that goes. 76 drones, so his work count's still kind of on the lower end of what you'd want at this stage. Tank's now in place, and maybe you just get Vipers up to help deal with what has been a tank transition from Bjorn to start dealing with this Hydra Force. And all these tanks get wiped out right here, but there's a lot of bio left over to go chasing. And the big issue for Doc right now, no Banelings ready to go. If there's Banelings ready, then Bjorn will not be able to push on through. And actually, Bjorn doesn't push on through, but this was absolutely a situation where I think Bjorn could have probably given chase and probably would have had a really good time fighting against what was here. Of course, Bjorn doesn't see what we see. So he doesn't decide to do that. Instead, he decides to lift up and drop off to the other side and then reinforce the right side. It can work as well. Might just be a bit of a more complex road to victory. So his Marines coming out on the watchtower. They're going to start simming through. Poor creep team is going down. Lots of these Lings in some trouble as well. Some of these creep team is going to be coming out into place and just going to be seeing our Marines... Hopping on over to the other side. Things crash in and the Marines continue to drop as the Hydras put some damage out. Yeah, push on the right is just unstoppable though because so much is on the top. Hatchery goes down and Dark loses control of his fifth base. And Dark trying to get into Adrenal Glands. 3-3 melee upgrades. I just... Lingbane Hydra doesn't do it for you at this stage of the game. Like The longer this game goes and you're on Lingbane Hydra, I mean you just need a follow up, right? Especially with the mid-game that he's had, I think, is the problem. I mean, Bjorn can just keep on playing bio tank here for basically forever. I mean, at least get Vipers up. He's got one. I mean, if that's all you can afford, it's all you can afford. But one Viper, I don't think, is going to be the game-changer either in this. And it just feels like we're having a pretty rough time here as Dark. Doesn't seem like this is going to be going anywhere too positive for him anytime soon. The Lurkers benefit from missile or melee upgrades? Missile upgrades. It's a range attack. They fire spines through the ground, you know? Just because, like, a, just because the units, you know, just because the spines fire from a melee position initially, it's still just a range attack that just goes, you know? Same as, like, if, a, you know, something attacked a Hydra from here, from, like, a step away, and the Hydra still fires a shot, it's still a missile shot, right? So, yeah, it's a range attack. I mean, it is an interesting situation with Roaches, right? Where Roaches actually have a, a melee attack and a missile attack. They do that melee attack when they're in melee range of units. It's uh, it's a funny one. As you can see, our bio force is uh, going to keep on pushing through this upper left-hand side. There's a couple of Banes coming forward. Our Queen's caught up in amongst that Ling Bane, as you just see our 3-3 three, three upgrades. Finally about to kick in from Dark. He's just losing so much as he has to retreat away from this position. Every time he's retreating with bio units in range, you're essentially just losing units, right? And it's very hard to, to protect yourself in those sort of situations. As you have a Marauder going to take the lead. Going to go after a creep team for a moment. Doesn't commit to it. Now he does and he gets it. Parasite like bombs on all the medivacs. Going to force some split aways. And now we're going to dive on in, so... Well, yeah, I mean, dive on into what is kind of a choked area with tank coverage. Isn't really working. I mean, Dark is still maxed out, don't get me wrong. I just feel like he's maxed out and his economy isn't quite where it needs to be, so I just don't see this continuing to go well for him. We're on a 5 base beyond now with a 6 base building, and Dark's just got no pressure on the map, so I just don't really see. He, need, he needs to win this fight. Big time. And Vipers will help him to do that. He needs to win this fight and go across the map and at least deny a base of Bjorn, I think, if he wants to have a winnable shot at this game. Here we go. Lingbane, Hydra, Lurker. Sorry, I keep saying lurkers, I mean queens. Coming through. Uh, blind clouds are good across the tanks. I mean, Bjorn pulling back into this gap. I think it's still just a very efficient trade for Bjorn. He's got some ghosts left here as well on the bottom side. In fact, he's just got a ton of bio left over as well. And yeah, he comes out of this with a supply lead. 
Ah. Just feels like a game Doc never really got into a comfortable position. I know in games 1 and 2 it kind of happened very early, but in this game, again, it just felt as though he never really got into the position which he really needed to be in, right? And that's a little bit rough as these siege tanks continue to fire. Lings and Banes take some extra shots off, and it's going to be seen how Ling Bane Hydra kind of wanting to wrap around from the upper left hand side. We're going to see another scan. Goes in between the uh, bases up here, just trying to see what you're flanking me with, right? Are you going to come in from the right and the left at the same time? John just wants to know whereabouts to keep his units. I like the ghost going to go, go into the corner. Uh, they obviously really want to hit the EMPs on these Vipers. He's going to line up a snipe on one, but it gets abducted. So one goes down, now a tank gets abducted in as well. Another couple tanks getting sieged up, these ghosts getting ready to rumble. There we go, Yun's gonna start running through. Ling Bay and Hydra are gonna run in at this army. Marines, tanks, can they hold on? The ghosts are pulling back as well. Haven't really had much of a chance to snipe. Now they line up a few snipes on Hydras. Only Hydras left with no Banelings remaining. We know how this story ends as Dark just does not have enough. And Yun plays a pretty, pretty solid best of three. A couple of, you know, this series kind of had it all for Bjorn, right? He had a, an aggressive game of his own, which he took a lead in and won. He had a defensive game of his own, which he took a lead in and won. And he had this more macro-focused game, which he took a lead in and won. Yeah, GG. So it was a fun one, actually. I kind of like this. I think it was very entertaining. I Maybe I'm biased. I'm a Bjorn fan, right? But uh, kind of a cool 3-0. And I, what I really loved more than anything, actually, is just the fact that Dark kind of went for a... Um, Dark kind of went for like this kind of different style in Game 3 to what we usually see Dark playing. So... I kind of liked that as well. I thought that was kind of a pretty cool little addition. You know, something a little bit different. So, yeah, a couple couple things to be, you know, to kind of find cool about it. I don't know. It was a cool series. I know a 3-0 is never, like, the best, but yeah, I feel like we've seen worse 3-0s in the past, you know?